to see me and everything's fine, right? Yeah, it's great. It's really okay. great. Okay. Well, before we start speaking about all your projects, because we, I would really uh, love to speak about all what you have done in this last couple of months, which is a lot, I would like to uh, know about this remote curating. So this is something that you came up with, and right. everybody is speaking about it at the moment. Um, can you first talk, talk about the idea of remote curating? Yes, thank you for... Um inviting me and um, I hello everybody uh, in Germany and uh, anybody around the world who happens to be listening to this. Um, good morning and I hope you're well. Um, you're taking care of yourself. It's a most trying time. Yeah, I mean, I, I developed this concept uh, of remote curating um, as a result and at the same time simultaneously with, um, with activities that I was involved with uh, at the beginning of this horrible moment. As you know, uh, because you, uh, I was uh, with you uh, at my exhibition in Dusseldorf at the Kai Ten Foundation, uh, that was right before I left for America. Um, and we, I, you know, I ended up, instead of going to Los Angeles where I, where I have my studio and I work normally, I ended up going to East Hampton where my brother had a cabin on a wooded area and I started secluding there. And all of a sudden I was, came up with a lot of realizations about digitality in itself. I mean, I already knew, I already knew that as a result of the pandemic that this, this, transition, to, this transition to complete digitality uh, would occur, meaning that we would, it, it has two parts. That dig, concept of digitality has two components. The first component is that we would start utilizing online venues a lot more. Like here we are uh, in Instagram live, but we have, there's also Zoom. Uh, we've been Zoom, this, the process of Zoomification has taken place. We're, we're ordering food over online. You know, all the things that are, I don't have to mention them. Everyone knows what they are. That yeah. was the first thing. The second component of the, this, this moment was that we would accept digitality. We would accept yeah. it into yeah. our lives. There had been a resistance. We, there had been a resistance to digitality. Like, for instance, I myself was against driverless cars. And I kind of still am because good people would lose their jobs. People who, had, who made mm -hmm. livings with their family, yeah. you know? So all of a sudden, digit, uh, driverless cars doesn't look so bad because uh, a car is coming and delivering your food without another human being there who could, who could transfer the disease to you yeah. and, and so forth and so on. So all of a sudden, these kind of anti-human, uh, anti-collective, anti anti-solidarity aspects of digitality didn't appear so bad. And now I was accepting it. So those are the two components. And what happens there is that, you know, this remote, this, this, this uh, transition to remo remoteness. And being, mm -hmm. I, the idea of remoteness is that we're not doing, we're, we're doing things remotely. We're doing things from a destination or a location, excuse me. We're, we're working at one location, like my house, or mm -hmm. here my, this Airbnb uh, rental that I have in, in uh, a place called Amagansett near Napi Beach. Um, I'm here, but yet I'm talking to you. So there, I'm remote. We're having a conversation, mm -hmm. but... But, but Warren, you are so remote, we just can't see you anymore. Can okay, you sorry. Look at, okay, that's better. Okay. Yeah. I, I have to yeah. put this down. I know I, I have a... <laughs> if I can put this down, and, you know. The problem is I'm trying to... Okay, we'll just do it like this. So, yeah. you know, this idea of remotely. I mean, we're doing everything remote. So, for Absolutely. instance, if I was a doctor, I could remotely see patients. They would mm -hmm. say I was a dermatologist and mm -hmm. a patient had a, a rash on their arm. The patient would call me at this online remote medical center and they would use the camera in their, in their phone, show me the rash on their arm. Yeah. And I would make a remote diagnosis from afar. I wasn't in the same room with the patient. I wouldn't touch the thing anymore. I wouldn't be able to take a sample of it. 
But oh. just based on its morphology, on the way it looked, I would operate remotely. Because so this oh. is the idea. This is the idea of where my idea of the remote curator. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's where the idea of the remote curator came in. Yeah, yeah. So I have made, I have, my last five projects or last four projects that we're going to talk about today, I wasn't there. I mean, for instance, in, in my drive-by art show, which, as you know, uh, was very embraced uh, very well by the artists that participated in the community, which it was in, I, uh, I did the whole thing uh, through internet through, um, I did it remotely. I organized how, how did the whole it start? Thing. So you started to ask uh, artists if they will participate in, yeah. in the project or you were looking for artists that are around you on Facebook? How, well, did, how, how came this idea up and how the, was the start of it? So it, it was, was in public space, right? Right, I mean, that was the next, that's the whole idea. I kind of, redef I was also redefining what public space would mean. Yeah. But before I get into that, I want to, just talk about a little more about the remotely. So yes, the first thing is I had three or four, four or five friends out here mm -hmm. that uh, I knew. And I, of course, the first thing I asked them is, you know, uh, did they have any friends who would like to be part of this project? Mm -hmm. And then it kind of, word to mouth and then mouth, you know, word to mouth, mouth to mouth. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I was asking, um, the, the, I met some of the curators. They suggested some curators out here. Andreas, Andrea Grover from the Guild Hall, mm -hmm. Kareen Ern, Ennis from Southampton uh, Art Museum. Not, it's called the Parish Art Museum, but it's the big mm -hmm. museum out here. And Christina Strasfield from the Gro uh, Guild Hall as well. They started giving me names of artists that they thought might want to participate. Okay. And so I started developing a long list. And of course, I didn't really know many of these artists, but I, I wrote to them about the idea uh, that I would be asking them to, in, you know, either show work that specifically uh, related to the pandemic or their feelings mm -hmm. about the pandemic or work that they made during the pandemic. And mm -hmm. they would just play that on their driveways and their mailboxes projected on their homes, uh, displayed on their front lawns. And I explained to them that, that the community would be, Oh, thank you very much. That's those are yeah, that's uh, Tony Ross's work on the top, and I, uh, yeah, that's Tony Ross's work. I can't really see the bottom piece. Oh yeah, Janet Goleas, uh, his work. Uh, oh no, uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, I asked them to display their work um, on their, you know, in the way you just showed a picture. Thank you. And people mm -hmm. from the community would drive around in the safety of their automobiles. Because at this time, That's we didn't really know how it was. Yeah, the safety of their yeah. automobiles. Because we didn't really know how this virus was spread. We, mm -hmm. There were so many rumors around, as there are today. And we still don't know that much. But at least we know more. And yeah. uh, it was so like people a full body mask. Yeah, full, yeah uh, a car is like an, a full body <laughs> full mask. Body exactly. Mask. <laughs> and uh, so people drove around. And it became very participatory as well, because the speculator yeah. became as essential to the exhibition as, as the artists themselves. But as I was saying, uh, that, that goes into the discussion between public art and, and private art, because public art in, in this moment of the pandemic and as drive-by art becomes private. It's, not, it, it, it's on your property. It's, on, um, it's mm -hmm. on, uh, in people's mailboxes. It's, they, mm -hmm. they, they uh, can do what they want. And then the people from the public, now the new public, the driving around public, the spectator public, uh, now is driving around and, and seeing it. But by That's the way, I'm doing A lot of people remotely. consider their cars as, as an extension of their private um, uh, uh, space as well, right? Exactly, exactly. It's a bubble. It's a kind of bubble, uh, a, uh, a bubble. The car mm -hmm. uh, takes on a new meaning. A car is not just a place to get you from one, your job, to, from your home to your job, or to do the grocery shopping. And I developed that word, drive-by art, is, my, is again, a word that I uh, invented. Mm -hmm. It's now, every day, I get a, new, uh, a, a Google alert telling me that somewhere in the world, there's someone doing either a drive-by a, a drive art. And what they'll do is they'll take one of the hyphens off. But it was interesting because that's also very interesting uh, because the drive-by had been used for drive-by shooting. 
And some mm -hmm. people were very, uh, felt a little uneasy about that name. But by the time I used it, it had already become, it had already become, the uh, concept of drive-by had been already circulating in, in, the, um, in the semantic milieu about drive-by births, drive-by weddings, drive-by, you know, birthday parties. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, it was already a term that had become expanded because of the pandemic. And then knowing that, I had, because, you know, artists are kind of ahead in a way. They, they have feelings and they, they connect to certain trends before the general public and they operate on them. Mm -hmm. um, I already knew that the term was no longer really related to drive-by art, although that was at its, its pathos. It had a pathos. And I, I, I'm an artist that embraces pathos. I'm not worried um, that maybe a couple of people would be offended by that term. Although I was aware of it, and uh, of course, if somebody wrote me and said they were offended, I would commiserate with them and explain to them that the term wasn't only about drive-by art, drive-by shooting anymore, that it had taken a much larger role. Anyway, the, the point of the matter is I did this whole thing remotely. Mm -hmm. And I did it from my house on the internet using my computer. And incidentally, what's interesting about drive-by art is that it had an internet component. It wasn't just something that took place in this private public space, but it was also involved in the internet. The internet, of course, and I, I, everyone knows this already, but I just say it, uh, it is a public space as well. One, by the way, that's becoming privatized, and uh, that's another problem, but it is a public space. And on the, on the, on the web, you could go to drivebyart.org and witnessed all the artists' names, where they located. And I had it linked up to a Google map uh, that you could, a Google map platform, so that mm -hmm. by connecting to the artists, you could also find their address, uh, click on the link, and it would take, uh, and all of a sudden a voice would come on uh, and direct you to the artist studio. Mm -hmm. That was the other component of it. So there was already an online component, which was another component of its pub pub public space. And then of course, um, you know, there was the whole idea of, of its online, um, the way that it took off online and became viral. I mean, there are all these other aspects of that, uh, uh, that happened. Uh, but as I said, it was done remotely. So then in the next project that I did, the next big project um, that I'm working on, and there were lots of other projects as well, but the next one that is going on right now and um, is at the downtown Ace Hotel, which is called 575. I'm working, I organize, and I also should say that, that the, that the drive-by art also went to LA. There were 186 artists in all who participated that I had. Yeah, and, and we I should had say as well that, 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 that there was so much response about this because I think that one of the things was that you did it so early. So it was at the end of March, beginning of April that you started it. And um, I think hyperallergic New York Times. So everybody was speaking about it because art forum, the, art, art forum, art forum. It was Time, was, was Time one magazine. new thing. It was, was Time incredible. magazine. It was yeah, an, yeah. it was a shock to me. Yeah, <laughs> it was a yeah, total shock. It was a total you know, shock. We were to me. also helpless. So what can we do? Everything was closed. Museum were closed. Galleries were closed at that time. And then there's something. There was one way how how we can yeah connect with each other. And feeling near, even yeah, remote, remote nearness, no? Yeah, remote, exactly. It, yeah. Because uh, and and the other thing was quite interesting, um, and I'm glad you brought that point up, is that the question is why did it have such an effect? I mean, normally, I do things that are four or five years ahead of their times, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm I'm telling you that as a kind of a problem that I have in my art practice. Uh, so that when I do something, it's, it, it doesn't really leave a mark. But in this case, I somehow um, was responding to uh, something that synchronously and simultaneously many other people were feeling, and it allowed them to overcome their despondency and their depression, and it allowed them a certain sense of collectivity and solidarity that, mm -hmm. on the other hand, by the way, the remoteness and the digitality disrupts as well. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because on one hand, this concept of remoteness and digitality 
is in, a, in many ways of a disruption of collectivity and a disruption mm -hmm. of solidarity. But on the other hand, I was able to manage somehow to create a platform both on the online and in the real world that allowed people to overcome the isolation uh, of this digitality and of the pandemic simultaneously. So that was, that was something that was uh, quite interesting. Um, I think, I think this is, there's one point what I think is very interesting. I was um, listening yesterday to the Art Angel podcast and they were speaking about that often art is in, in the internet is a product and art cannot be a product. And this is often the problem what, what we have in these days that like if Amazon is doing Art Amazon, then they, they make a very nice product production and description, but not something where it's a connection. And, and I think this is something what you brought up at that point, that, that, that we have all this story going around and seeing from one side to the other, from, from one spot to the other, and, and make this con connection physically and as well remote. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, yeah, it was just one of those things. It, it was, yeah, but I wasn't making, the artists were making the artwork, I was creating a I kind of platform. So what I would say, well, th there's, there's a lot of depth to your question and complexity mm -hmm. uh, that uh, to your statement and your question that I could address. Um, but before I do that, if you don't mind, um, I kind of want to go, I want to go back to your, to what you were saying before about all the media response. And the question is, why did I get so much media response? Mm -hmm. Was it because I touched a nerve? this collective mm -hmm. nerve in a moment of non-collectivity, mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a nerve of solidarity in a moment of dissolidarity? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what was it? And, mm -hmm. what I, and, and, and um, how come that in this public sphere of the media, but don't forget yeah. um, that the media itself is a public sphere, that in that public sphere, I had already, I was all, all coming, I, was, I had come alive that my story and the exhibition that I had remotely curated had, had come alive. And the story about that is very interesting because what happened was there was an empty space in mediation, in cultural mediation, that culture has, is, defined not, it is defined not only by the products that artists make or by uh, you know, all of the socio-political, economic, and historical relations that all combine together to create this mm -hmm. complex network of relations what we call culture. But the art galleries were closed. The museums were closed. There was nothing to write about. There was an empty space in the media public sphere. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, happened to have a story. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not downgrading the the quality or the excitement that was generated by my exhibition or the sense of community and mm -hmm. solidarity i'm not i'm not dissing that i'm just saying that the reality of it is that there was an opportunity because of this lack in a very laconian yeah. sense it was a, a sense of lack and i fulfilled that sense of lack so here was a story that went viral because there was no other cultural news. Normally, and this is the key, the, um, the, uh, what, what I would call the art market, the art world in its moment of neoliberal capitalism, snuffs out and represses stories of collectivity and solidarity. And it's all about market value market value transcending cultural value. But in this moment of lack, in this moment when there weren't a lot of other uh, cultural activities around, mm -hmm. market value was trumped by cultural value and cultural yeah. value transcended market value in a real way. It's something that was real. And you mm -hmm. have these moments, 1987, it happened when the market collapsed, the art market collapsed, and we transcended into 90s art and we moved away from the neoliberal art, uh, artists of the 1980s. In America, Cal uh, Dusseldorf, uh, Dusseldorf and Cologne, the 80s art is a completely different phenomena. 
it's nothing related to what happens in America. But America, but in America, eighties art is about that, about the marketing and commoditization of conceptual practices that had been unable to be commoditized, that become commoditized and develop value. And that all collapsed in 1987. In Cologne, the, our, the, the uh, 80s was a completely different thing and shouldn't be, people should be aware of that. Although there were a lot of American artists coming over and showing in some of the galleries uh, of, of Cologne. The Cologne itself, the 80s was very, very different. Mm -hmm. So I'm, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say, and I don't want to get too far off because I, you know, I know yeah. we only have a limited amount of time, was that there was a space for me and my project to emerge in. Yeah, that was important. So I wanted to say that because you asked about all the yeah. media attention I got. And I yeah. think that's why I got so much media attention because yeah. of that lack. Uh, going back to remote curating, yeah. and private and public space, that's I'm working with the Ace Hotel. And today, if you go to the down, if you go to my Facebook page, I just I just listed it. Lawrence Weiner has this beautiful haiku. Right, that's the that is the um, the Ace Hotel. But right now we have um, Lawrence Weiner, mm -hmm. who has made a beautiful haiku, um, and he we just put it up last night, and you okay. can go see it and all that. But you can get an idea that twelve yeah. artists were invited: Charles Gaines, um, Kim Gordon. Um, and, uh, David Horvitz, many, many yeah. artists were invited. Uh, a very, very um, divergent uh, group of people, of, you know, that were fluid, uh, gender fluid and racial. Not only artists, but also yeah. songwriters and poets, right? Right, exactly. It's songwriters, poets. And so they, they all, for one week, have they've written something and they, it, mm -hmm. and it's, the Ace Hotel has been nice enough to supply the engineers and all the letters and everything like that. So it's a private public, again, it's a, it's a public space, it's yeah. private. It's about, it's about the song of language and it's about, about finding alternative spaces that yeah. were always so, there, that were always there. And, but, and, 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 and they have been used in the past at times like this, mm -hmm. yeah. At times and, like this, there, there have been other projects that, you know, have done similar things, but it's always at this moment of crisis. It's always at this moment when of disruption that this, the pre-individual of the public space, the multiplicity mm -hmm. of, the mul of the multiple, the minor histories of a public space, the un undercommons of a public space, all the things that, that are normally um, repressed by the overriding major culture or major economic culture mm -hmm. during times of disruption, those subsuming and sublimating powers are released and other forms of activity, other forms of meaning can, can gain that public space, can mm -hmm. gain that public sphere, can mm -hmm. gain that pu the public imagination and become part of the public imagination. And that's what these projects that I'm, I'm doing are. Yeah. Yeah, and this this um, uh, display board on the on the hotel was like in the public space and in the street where the everyday traffic goes um, goes by, and and you inserted poetry in this um, public space. So it's um, it's a whole different level than than the everyday um, level of, of of daily business. And right, because they would be right. normally they would normally be on the marquee would have like the acts that were playing at this at the ace theater they would have you know hotel specials it, it, it was all about the economy and also famous you know using you know i mean it was all about the economy it was all about marketing and all these other kinds of things and here we have a moment in which it is a beautiful opportunity to express uh ideas and express poetry and maybe this is what, this can lead us to the next project, uh, yes. which we want to talk about. Why art is so important in these times? Um, so it's it says it says it's backwards, but it's, it's yeah, on the, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But it says yeah. artists are essential workers. Art is an essential service. Yeah, and cool. yeah, and it was on one. Of, now that's what's really was great about this piece was that for me. I'm saying, and, and some yeah. of the people, 
So I just want to say that, yeah, I'll tell you about a new project that's happening uh, that using these, but for now, let's focus on what this is all about. So mm -hmm. again, I'm in East Hampton and I'm in, you know, various places. I'm in Wainscott, right. It became a mask. Um, and uh, you can go online and find out, you know, where you can, you know, the, the Guild Hall right now in yeah, East Hampton yeah. is sponsoring this project and you can get a limited edition mask from them. Just go to Guild Hall and you'll see all the information, how to do it and all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to make, I want to say a few things about the sign. The first thing is what's crazy about the story of that sign is that at first, we have it at Guildhall. Guildhall invites me to, um, to uh, display this piece. And uh, Christine Strassfield and Andrea Grover, fantastic curators, really cool people. And we put it in their parking lot. It was facing the street, of course, but it's in their parking yeah. lot. And all of a sudden, the police are coming around. And the town of East Hampton is coming around and telling them they have to remove it. Uh, and we, nobody could understand why. Why would they want to remove it? Well, it turned out that they didn't think it was an artwork. Mm -hmm. they, they told the museum that this sign was not an artwork. Okay? But there was another... Uh, and what does that mean? Does that mean that Duchamp's urinal, Armut, is that an art... Is it not an artwork in 1917? I mean, are we still having that discussion of what an mm -hmm. artwork is? I mean, hello? Yeah. You know, it's like, are we now going back to the discussions about abortion, that are, are the right of a woman to, to have control of her her own body? All of a sudden, yeah. that's becoming an issue again? Like, yeah. what's yeah. that all about? That's another discussion. We can, like, we can have another conversation about that. But <laughs> I'd rather say that here we are, almost yeah. 100, la 100 years later, because yeah. uh, our month was 1917, uh, 100 years later, we're having people tell the museum people from the town that this piece is not an artwork. So uh, the town is telling them what the artwork is, not the museum uh, uh, telling the community, right? Okay. Um, so same problem with the Tate right now. Uh, but anyway. But let us speak so, about, about the okay. content because here in this sign is this, this public sculpture is artists are essential workers, art is an essential service. Why? Right. Tell us well, a little bit what is... Well, this is what I want to say. First of all, what happens is the real truth of the matter with the police, and I'll get to your question, I promise, but it, mm -hmm. it has to come through here, was that normally the police are using and the state are using these devices mm -hmm. to inform the community about governmental regulation. Wear yeah. a mask, don't drive too fast, um, road closed. And here, as an artist, I was uh, taking this ready-made and mm -hmm. creating an artistic message. This yeah. was the real issue, that I was, I, I, had, I was using something, even though anybody can rent one of these, one of these, uh, they're mm -hmm. called digital, uh, digital billboards, yeah. right, that you put along the highway. Anybody can, can rent it. The fact of the matter is, is that the government wants control of this message, mm -hmm. and wants the control of this iconography, okay? Mm -hmm. so, that's part one. Part two is, yes, artists are essential workers. Art is an essential service. Now, if you look on, I put that on, on Facebook. I put that on Instagram. And lo and behold, one or two out of 100 people were offended by it. How can you compare an artist to an essential worker? Someone at the front lines in this battle against COVID who risking their lives. I mean, what could an artist be? How could you compare an artist? And, and why, you know, why would you say that, you know? So we got out of 80, 98 responses were amazing. Artists were like, thank you, you know, but there were 2% that were saying, you know, this is offensive, you know, so why would, so we don't need to talk about the 98 who understand it because artists are, are being affected acutely by loss of exhibitions, loss of their chance to be in an art fair, loss of museum exhibitions, uh, all these kinds of things. Um, being, being secluded means you know, people don't come to their studio, all that kind of thing. And don't forget that artists are what are called precarious workers, mm -hmm. at least in America. Don't forget, this is all taking place in America, so the situation may be different here. But artists don't have health insurance, right? We, they, don't have a, they don't have a safety net. They don't have a safety net, although there have been some examples of Los Angeles, for instance, offering 
extra some money to keep artists alive you know there has been a couple of those mm -hmm. but nothing like germany nothing like germany so it's a totally different situation we're precarious workers right and so what happens is is that artists are essential workers yes 98 percent of want, want the world to know that we need we are we are there we, we our lives are precarious but most importantly artists are essential for the spirit mm -hmm. of humanity and art galleries are more important than ever as places of respite. Mm -hmm. It's not about the body. Yes, the essential worker at the hospital at the front lines of coronavirus are, you know, maintaining the health and well-being and saving lives of the body. But without the spirit, where are we? Yeah. Absolutely. But but anyway, when you see the 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 the, the people that are working in the hospitals, you know, I, I don't know how it was in, in, in the United States, but in Germany, they were always, you know, clapping uh, and applauding them on balconies in the evening. And uh, but they did not get one cent more and they don't earn money by doing what they are doing. It's, 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 it's incredible. It's like, right. And so this this is a comparison, which is really very, very obvious as well. Exactly, exactly doing important things and not being estimated enough as they, they should. well i mean i think that teachers are essential workers yeah absolutely. i think that um you know the guy delivering your food is an essential yeah, yeah. worker i'm not i'm not saying that artists are the only essential worker of course. but i wanted to give a shout out i wanted to yeah. be a shout out because as an artist yeah. i have to i'm feeling certain things and i want to express those things to other people and i want people to know you know how artists mm -hmm. are dealing with all this so it's it's more about yeah you know but, mm -hmm. uh, but as i mentioned as i mentioned um you know as i mentioned yeah but i wanted to know one yeah. one thing i wanted to get out of you you know like this artist and art is essential so tell us a little bit about your ideas about what art is doing with the brain why it is so important as well to to, to think in this cognitive uh, things about art? Well, the most, well, I think that what's essential now about my work in activist neuroaesthetics is mm -hmm. its relationship to neural diversity. We're, mm -hmm. we're understanding neural diversity in ways today that we never did before. Neural diversity, what that means, I mean, there's, there's like three definitions, okay? The first definition, of course, for any uh, uh, parents out there who have children with art, uh, attention deficit disorder or, or on the aut autistic spectrum, um, we are understanding that these are no longer diseases and they shouldn't be considered pathological conditions. However, they are conditions of what we are now calling the diverse brain that mm -hmm. people with autistic spectrum or people that are ADD, they don't have pathological conditions, they have different brains. The organization of the architecture of their brains is different. And as a result, the kinds of behaviors that they manifest are different. And of course, mm -hmm. there are a lot, the reason it's called the autistic spectrum is we have very, very severe cases of, 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 of the ways the brain's architecture, it becomes mm -hmm. diverse beyond a certain limit. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. the key that uh, along a certain limit. But it does also mean that within a, another limit, there are ways of uh, that people who have autistic spectrum can have very, very meaningful lives. They can be tremendous, they can give tremendously to the community and they shouldn't be looked at as a, a, um, as a, uh, as a, a pathological condition. You know, mm -hmm. unless, unless they be, it's, it's so severe, you know, so I think that's key. So diversity, neural diversity is, is, is this generalized term that talks about this. And, and maybe perhaps children with ADD are the future brain. That in a, in a world of mass communication and multiplicity of screens between your iPhone, your iPad, your computer screen, the screens that are electronic billboards that we see, that perhaps mm -hmm. this disattention this or the ability of multi attentions, right, mm -hmm. could be something that is favorable. And in in generations to come, they will be, they will they will develop into uh, people who who have the most uh, dexterity in mm -hmm. that new community. And and we see this. For instance, five thousand years ago, 
we didn't read or write. There wasn't a part of the brain for reading and writing, obviously, because there was no such thing as reading and writing after the Sumerian tablets. And mm -hmm. into today, if you put a person underneath uh, a MRI machine, of course, there are areas like the fusiform gyrus and the temporal lobe and the right, uh, left temporal lobe that lights up when the people are reading. The brain has changed. Now, there was a group yeah. of people who had a predis a, their brain's neural architecture was predisposed to this ability to read and write. And also mm -hmm. from a phylogenetic point of view, there are co commonalities with, with certain kinds of simian behavior, simian reading of facial gesticulations and things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. that come into this whole spectrum. So too with a ch child with ADD. This, yeah. Again, along the spectrum, that person brain may be more predisposed to uh, in, enjoying and, and operating successfully in a mediated environment. Now, that's one definition of neural diversity. And we have to care. The caring yeah. and the caring of neural diversity is, is, is what I'm talking about, you know, the yeah, caring yeah. of neural diversity. Then there is an understanding that this brain, that the brain is a place of, of diversity. And we have to, uh, we have to understand that. The second thing, of course, is the role of art. What does the role mm -hmm. of art have to do with neurodiversity? And then we get into 